Right on, g'day, money miners. Welcome back to another week, boys. A bit lethargic today, sorry. Had about 25 schooners or two is new and lost 100 in the pokies in my hometown on the weekend, New South Wales. Well done, mate. Whew. That's um, that's almost, that deserves almost as big a round of applause for JD who ran a bloody marathon yesterday. Oh, I, th- I think you went out here, Matty. <laughs> <laughs> doing God's work. Quite, <laughs> aren't we? We're both doing God's work in different ways, mate. Aren't we just? Speaking of bloody old God's been uh, busy over the weekend, big Chris Ellison <laughs> picking up a plant in Lake Johnston. We are going to go into that, mate. South 32, Jesus Christ, cyclones. Not good. Bad. Nothing, nothing. That is probably one thing. It's like nothing ever comes good, good out of a cyclone. <laughs> no. Except maybe an insurance claim. Yeah. But yeah. No, yeah, no. Maybe good. some crops grow if it's on a in a drought. But yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Oh yeah. They've not been ripped out the ground. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Fuck me, dead, mate. The battle for Nee and Zaga is this the checkmate. Yep, oh, mate, I love talking about the Battle for Nian Saga. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mate, uh, what else we got? A bit of nickel industries production issues. Mate, metal prices. Mate, there's a bit happening, JD. Yeah, going to touch that on. UBS email in the morning. Jesus Christ, there's a bit going on. Sure is. We're going to talk about iron ore and copper. And Javois and more rain at Regis. Far out. Bloody mm. God, Mother Nature, get your shit sorted. Right, Min Res. The headline today, straight up. Buying the Lake Johnston nickel concentrated plant off Poseidon. Mm. We'd um, had a few guesses in around what they might be picking up. Obviously, no secret. Ellison had said at the end of the uh, call a month or so ago that he was looking at latent infrastructure that was, you know, not really being used. So the the Lake Johnston from Poseidon is what he's picked up today. So this one sits 150 kilometres southwest, roughly, of Cow. Now, what they want to do is obviously convert this into a lithium processing hub. So right now it's got 1.5 million tonne per annum capacity with a float circuit and the the sort of conversion of the the plant there will include DMS capacity once it's all done and dusted there. There's also an interesting line where MINS explicitly state that they're going to look to process amongst other or third-party ore in exchange for project equity. So that sort of plays into the strategy of what they're doing here in this part of the, the gold fields, which we'll get into a bit later on. Now, there's a, another key detail that stood out to me. Groundwater extraction license comes with uh, everything they're picking up here. So this is super important. We've spoken about it. You've gone into great detail with um, nickel as well as lithium players. I Just think we're talking about the, that Cam Balder concentrator that it would have been one of the draw cards as well as getting hold of the bloody fresh water. Yeah, just just how important water is in the whole area. We've spoken about it in the context of Linus as well. For all these companies that want to do downstream processing – it's just super, super important. So maybe you can buy Linus's um, water agreement off them, mate. If they mothball Calgary, more more latent <laughs> infrastructure, <laughs> <laughs> mate. Mate, if they've got that bloody license, they're ready to go on the bores, mate. They the first thing they should be doing when they get there to site is ripping that out, chucking it in a get wet bladder. <laughs> It's a no-brainer. Oh, mate, that'll be the first thing to do. Mate, modifications to the plant. It's not just for bloody dust depression that we we're talking about. Mate, modif- modifications requires concrete, cement, and water. You can use the bloody water for that. Fire suppression, fill up the fire tanks. Bloody, mate, the water is there in case something shit hits the fan. Potable water for the camp. Mate, a get-wet bladder. Mate, I reckon when we... Look at Google Maps soon. Once it starts updating with the satellite imagery, there is going to be bladders everywhere. Like they will just be sticking out like a bloody pimple. They're unbelievable. So I look for a pimple to that's good to um, you know use as a pillow. After you can't you pop it beers. either because it's got a twenty year life. Impossible to pop. So mate, get a bloody mate. You got to give Matty Hall a buzz and get wet ASAP. Well said, Matty. Min well reds, said. They'll be all over it. Right, JD, what are they paying for this? So one million bucks up front, pretty much on the on the signing. Then a, another six and a half is going to go once it's sort of finalised. And then seven and a half in 12 months' time. So all in, 15 million bucks, plus a 0.75% royalty on lithium and 1.5% on other minerals. Now, that is just on the tenements that they're picking up as a part of this acquisition. So that doesn't count for or the other dirt that will go through the the plant itself. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. So the the cash that Poseidon are getting here, you know, call it fifteen million 
over over the next year, that's going to go a bit of a ways to keeping the lights on there. I think we'd spoken in the past about how they had, you know, relatively high corporate costs given the uh, the nature of the business. 1.4 million went out the door at the door on staff, admin, and corporate costs in the last quarter alone. So obviously, and selling that's even after Peter Harold stepped down to yeah. be a Ned because he was getting paid shitloads, wasn't he? Yeah, he sure was. So obviously, Lake Johnston leaving means the the ongoing costs will be a bit lower. This is something that was costing them a bit of a money. And then they also touched on in the announcement that removing this balance sheet, the rehab liability from the balance sheet, will make that look a little better. Remember, um, remember Alison's quote. It was, yeah, we're we're looking to you know partner with parties. Uh, where we can lend our expertise, sort, sort of. of. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder if they'll be looking at Black Swan as well. Like that's that's sort of that's north of Kalgoorlie, and we'll go into what the we think the what the strategy might be here. But that's sort of, that's north of Cal. It doesn't really look to have any sort of close synergy with anything. Like it's will look like like Mana Lithium Project, for instance. I think it was like 170 k. So. And then it, that's another concentrator sitting there on Poseidon's books, but I'm I mean, I'm not sure if it's yeah unless he's just going to have frigging plants everywhere and just bloody yeah so make he, a lot of money off the haulage. Mate, take your pick of nickel concentrators that you want to pick yeah, up. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at this one, you know, it's it hadn't been a secret that Poseidon were looking to get rid of it for a while. We pulled up an article from 2016 where Kidman Resources had an agreement with Poseidon to use the, at the time, mothballed Lake Johnson processing facility to process ore from the Mount Holland lithium mine. Ah. So that was obviously before that had been turned into a mine and then West Farmers and yeah, SQM and everything. Yeah, they're further west. Aren't, yeah, that's further yeah. west from um, mm. Lake Johnson. Not yeah, yeah that's away, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. so all in, I reckon this Stage is actually... Vu, mate. Uh, Bloody hell. Say again? Deja vu, just a different party. Absolutely. <laughs> so all in, I reckon this is a um, a pretty good deal for Mins. I'm not sure what you guys think, sort of stepping back from it and having a look at what Mins have done here. But obviously they had all the negotiating power with Poseidon. They've come in, they haven't paid an awful lot. They've got an airstrip, camp, concentrator, and other infrastructure, mining leases, mineral rights, water rights, importantly, as we touched on. So I don't think it's too bad at all. And tying that into the strategy I, you know, I still can't quite work it all out. It's not actually as close as you might have first thought to Bald Hill, Mount Marion, Manor, Pioneer Dome, Boldania. Pioneer, yeah. So I think I think it's about 170 k's from Pioneer Dome. Probably I think about 190 or something from Boldania. So yeah. it's not close, but there there was a bit of um, a bit of commentary in it about. Yeah, as you said, they'll put in. It's for f- they're going to put flotation there and and a DMS. So they're talking mm. about taking the fines from Mount Marion and Bald Hill and taking them to this one and repurposing this flotation circuit to then treat the lithium fines. Mm. And it said that was going to be their first flotation, but I'm sure there's flotation at Mount Marion. It just doesn't work. Is it working though? <laughs> it just doesn't work. So, yeah. Um, unless they're going to start from scratch on this on this a bit. So that. That's obviously an interesting piece, but is I, I can't see that being the primary purpose for getting this plant just to treat fines. Because yeah, if you're just going to treat fines, you wouldn't need a DMS circuit. I'm not sure on that, unless you run it through again just in case. But um, you just float the fines. But what else is at play? What's around, right? It's like yeah, I mean Mount Holland, but I mean they've got their own infrastructure. Mm. They What's nearby that yeah. you could feed to it. Well, you've got what well, – like Baldonia is an interesting one. That's sort of just sitting there under Lion Town's banner. And we did yeah. talk last week. I'm like, it's probably a little card up their sleeve to got – yeah. they've got to get some cash. 15, it's only sitting at 1%. I think it's a 1%. It's not like a knockout. Yeah, they've 15 that, million tonnes at 1%. They've yeah. got that farming agreement with Pantoro, remember, too, and they've got the – they're you not know, buying a lithium rights from Pantoro. So, yeah. that, I mean, that, that Norseman's is just – it's just east of – of Lake Johnson, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think like your logical place for if they were going to pick up a Baldonia, and the logical place if you're going to take the fresh rock somewhere to for the first stage, it'd be taking that up to Bald Hill. That's a lot closer than than this is. Mm. Um, there, I think that's actually because I looked on the map. I think I've got it down here. That's what eighty k's. Gotcha. Up there's a road straight from Baldonia, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, it depends on how once you get all these and you, how much bloody capacity you got between Mount Mary and Bald Hill and they might truck it a bit extra to um, chuck it into this plant. But I guess the ones that, that sort of stick out are 
the all that lo- the big hype around the Lake Johnson area end of last year, like the old tethered goat TG six, because their their tenements are right are right near there. That's what actually what it stands for, tethered, <laughs> tethered goat. Seriously? Yeah, they were gonna call it tethered goat. But they said no. I thought this was just another one of your nicknames. No, no, it's actually they were going to call the company (laughs) Tethered Goat. So it is. That's what it is. So that if you think of like what they're what they're getting this plant for, yeah. So there's I think because they got a mineral resource coming out soon. It's pretty. It looked like it'd be bloody hard going. These flat stacked ore bodies. Um, But talking about taking equity in it, wouldn't they? Wouldn't Minres, you think of it from their position, instead of taking equity themselves, like because they've got the little special purpose vehicle now, you'd say, called Delta Lithium that they've sort of got a, uh, got control over. So because you think of Minres, if they, they've got the plant, wherever they're going to mine it from, I would assume they get the haulage contract with all their bloody automated trucks on the roads. They get the tolling arrangement. They'll get the mining services contracts. Then the other vehicle can bloody take the risk and um, – and do the mining, but all there's just a big revenue circle that comes back to to min res. So I think I think this was more a a regional strategy, not just to sort of feed what they've got already. Whether I don't know whether Delta might look at that using that vehicle to get hold of other ones in that Lake Johnson. <laughs> Who Mate, knows? No one will I've got my eye on it. No one will critique you for. Um yeah, putting your balance sheet at duress if you just use Delta's balance sheet instead. <laughs> well, they, well, they had $116 million in cash and cash equivalents at the end of last quarter. I know they'd done that. Uh, well, they had those little J, farming JVs with um, Voltaic and stuff yep. last yeah. week. Yeah, by the way, he's but, now a uranium company. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably some copper pop up there too soon. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's setting MinRes up pretty bloody well, isn't it? Even though they're, what, 23% shareholder in Delta, but. It's they can they'll secure all that that whole bloody chain of events for any lithium that goes in that area, yeah, and, and get paid the money. En- encourage more, you know, lithium work in and around the area, and they can be that sort of central hub. Maybe that's the the strategy. It looks they, quite early stage. Oh, but it's all hinging on price. Absolutely, like and that's, that what, price we're, that's been... what we're waiting for. Wonder if the if the calves the calves bloody uh, prophecies will come true if they because it um I would assume it thousand bucks uh spod price that these things wouldn't be you wouldn't you wouldn't be mining thin ore bodies and trucking at hundreds of kilometers at a uh, thousand bucks spod so it looks like minres are betting their bloody balls on well they're not essentially betting on it they're in the position if it does go up they're in the perfect position because they've got the bloody controlling all the infrastructure yeah and this know. is a a, a relatively small check for, for Minres to write. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. What do you reckon, Trav? Have you got any hunches? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's like, it's not, like, you know, it's not a big deal in terms of quantum. Um, I'm not sure the read through on like the, the neighboring like ore bodies, I, like I wouldn't draw that string just yet because it's like a small amount of money that they're just picking it up. You know, who knows what they're going to do with it. It seems like that you're right. They're long infrastructure in the region and, um, mm. I think there is a bit to play out on how it all fits together, but I like throwing darts, Matty. Yeah, yeah, really yeah. Devastated. Are you getting on board with the dart throwing a bit now? Like, if I tell him, <laughs> I'm rubbing off on you a bit. Mate, because they've got, they've got bloody their f- fingers in that many pies, but um, I guess, and there's not many they don't, but one, I've figured out one that they don't, and that's expiration drilling. And I'm thinking, why don't they actually just drill their own shit? Like, <laughs> it makes sense. Um, that's not a bad shout when you think about it. They want to start an airline, but why don't they just start a bloody exploration drilling company? I think I think I've figured out why. Why is that, Matty? It shows they're listening to the show because they've heard the K drill ads and they've figured, well, that is one industry. I do not, we do not think we're going to get a competitive advantage in one That's because they point. would. You have to recruit Ryan O'Sullivan, and that bloke bleeds K drill. Absolutely mm. bleeds K drill. And mate, he mate, you'd have to throw him a big bone. He's got K's tattooed on his left and right biceps, which yeah. are also uh drip drip drills. They hundred <laughs> percent are Ricardinio. Can you imagine going head to head against Ryan? Well, I think that that now that is validation for K drill as a business for RC drill and diamond air core that expiration is drilling is the one thing that Minres aren't gonna 
Yeah. The one pie they're not going to put a finger in because they know that K Drill is <laughs> in the arena and it's not worth their while. So, mate, you cannot get more validation from that. And the fact that Rhino Sullivan is involved means that pff, just, yeah, yeah. They're, they're obviously spending their energy elsewhere. So They're, they're like, sorry, Stewie, we're going to compete with you, but um, no, nah, we're not, we're not going to enter the, <laughs> the exploration drilling arena. Yeah, I think I think K-Drill probably went and told them that. They just said, look, <laughs> as a, just a bit of um, common courtesy, we're just letting you know that this is our domain around here. So, mate, they're probably <laughs> going to pepper a few holes around Lake Johnston and get, mate, if those lithium prices go up, K-Drill are going to be the reason this – Friggin' arena gets happening. So, absolutely. I look forward to seeing some bloody dirt piles on the Google Maps there from K Drill. <laughs> Love your work, boys. Right. And, oh, and a bit of other min- Minres news. Uh, some, oh, good. Geez. That's the thing. If something gets reported, hey, we're running with it. So, because it was reported the other week that the contract dispute for the Onslow Hall Road was. And it was narrated like it was the Hall Road. But with there's a West Australian article out mid last week saying that the contractor dispute was for this adjacent light vehicle access road, not the actual Hall Road. And bloody, yeah, we, we ran with it. So And so did every other bastard. But well, um, well, there was some clarification there. AFR broke that story. You know who didn't report on that story? The West oh, Australian. But they've reported this bit. The West Australian yeah. reported this one. And also, I mean, we can flash up another article if we want, where it's revealed that Chris Allison is um, underwriting the launch of the Nightly, which is Kerry Stokes, a.k.a. the West Australian's um, masthead. Oh. Then you think. So I think you get a, you get a few, you get to pull a few strings when you're a big advertiser <laughs> on, a, on something, mate. The stories <laughs> might paint you out favourably or not. They might point out some things and clarify others for you, just depending on how much advertising money you spend. Yeah, I'm surprised it took this long for this to come out. <laughs> I found that very interesting. Mm. Yes, right. Oh, uh, next, next, next. Fucking South bloody two thirty-two. Too to scroll through. <laughs> right, South thirty-two, mate. Cyclone South thirty-two. What's going on, mate? This is um. Yeah, I mean they've announced today that they're halting operations at uh, Groot, Groot Island. So this is their Gemco uh, operation, and my favourite company, gents, the mighty South thirty-two. But this is some not so mighty news, unfortunately, because. There's some, there's some damage caused to the Gemco as a result of, of Cyclone Megan. Gemco, if, if you're not familiar, and I don't blame you for not being familiar, um, it's 60% owned by South 32 and 40% owned by Anglo-American. This this is the island which which produces um, manganese, and this island is located, if you think of like Australia, the, the like cut out of Australia, you know that little square cut out in the north, mm. in our Northern Territory, the island's in there. Um, and look, if you read South 32's announcement this morning, they kind of make it out like it's a bit of a nothing burger, not too much to see here. They just dropped this one page announcement. The announcement's not even flagged as market sensitive on ASX. In this announcement, you see, they say that operations are temporarily suspended and they say there's some structural damage to the wharf, but no big deal, right? Then you go to the AFR article on the matter and you get the impression that there's a bit more to this story than initially meets the eye. Um, as you can see here, the, the headline, Cyclone Megan wreaks havoc on South 32 Manganese Port. Uh, and there's like a pretty startling quote within the AFR article, which I think is worth reading out. In quotation marks, there will not be a ship loading at the port for a long time, if ever, depending on the cost to rebuild the limited life of mine, claimed a source close to the manganese exporters' operations. Mm, jeez. That seems like a, a, a statement that doesn't match up with the non-market sensitive, you know, one-page announcement out from South 32. And like to be clear, the stock price actually went up over four percent today, which is um, a real, real head scratcher. So, so the market either considered the news a non-event, or the market hasn't really grappled with the potential implications from the little information they've received so far. And if if you look at how you know the brokers actually value Gemco, they allocate at four to five percent of South 32's total NAV. But they tend to model it with this, you know, limited mine life. And the reality is South 32 is extending <coughs> its, its mine life to the, the southern leases on, on, the, um, on the island, which, you know, can give it a lot more than just between 4 and 5% of NAV if you, if you look at the extended mine life scenarios there. So maybe they're going off that 4 to 5%, less than 5 not material. <laughs> I mean, but yeah, look. Uh, anyway, it's it's – it's you could you could think of that four to five percent. Is it not a huge value driver? But it's not insignificant either in the no. context of the of the business, right? It's pretty pretty significant, I think. Um, and I think it's worth sharing how a few other 
like just a few market perspectives around this story. And, and I think there's still a while before the dust settles here. But firstly, I just want to like point to some pictures. There's this there's this article out from a, the ABC that they actually uploaded this article yesterday. And there's some pictures of, of what people, you know, residents on the island have actually taken to show the impact that the cyclones had. Far out. There's some, some pretty devastating ones there. You know, oh, trees. Is that someone's boat? Yeah, tr- oh, trees uprooted, um, just flash flooding on the island. You can see the, um, you know, waves just coming in to the island there. The road there is like literally water bubbles on the road. Um, Cop 430 mils in, in under 24 hours, I read. It's, Bloody hell. It's pretty horrific sort of scenes. It's, it looks really grim. It's clearly devastated the island and, you know, wreaked havoc on the infrastructure there. And like to South 32's operation specifically, there's a few posts on Twitter worth pointing out, I'll, um, which I'll read off. This, this tweet's from Martin Rogers, who says, heard the South 32 Groot Island Gemco manganese mine has completely shut down and the damage is so extensive of a ship crashing into the loading wharf that the infrastructure is absolutely destroyed. They won't ship off that wharf again and we'll have to build a whole new infrastructure. I think the South 32 A6 announcement this morning seems minimized and understated. I mean, there's some conjecture in amongst that, but there's a general theme amongst some of these, you know, tweets I'll read out, which which might point to, you know, the extent of damage being um, a lot more substantial as per the AFR article too. Um, you know, in buy, buy low, sell high says, company not releasing full impact of the destruction to port and ship, both are staffed. Re speculator says, this is not a small deal. Though the extent of damages are TBD, why would you have a heavy dry bulk ship docked to port with a cyclone coming through? Clown emoji, clown emoji. And then the koala responds, if you can't run an operation like this sensibly, what makes them think they can build an underground zinc mine halfway around the world? Jeez, nothing nothing, <clears throat> nothing like being in the public eye when you're down, eh? Just <clears throat> the old Twitter sphere fucking into them. Yeah. But yeah, no, nah, it's pretty uh, sad for all the residents there and I hope everyone's safe uh, totally. during that. A lot so. of people live in poverty on that island, so yeah, you do hope. Hope that everyone's lives are accounted for. And yeah, okay. yeah. No, bloody shocking. Right, uh, Trav, the battle for Neen Zaga, uh, the Orcorp, Silver Corp, Perseus battle. Jeez, she's uh, – the big dick play was today from Perseus. Was it checkmate, Trav? I think it is, nearly. Um, Unpack it for us. Yeah, please feel free to, you know, interrupt me as I go here because I'll lose my breath for sure if <laughs> I just got a monologue. But – um. I'm loving this battle and it's a, it's a really interesting, you know, live M&A battle because you're, you're just seeing this absolute fight happen in plain sight without anyone actually upping their offer. And that's just, love it, mate. It's all strategy. Um, so remember, Perse used to try to acquire Orcorp for 55 cents cash, but the Orcorp board is yet to budge from their recommendation to accept the Silvercorp offer, which is mostly denominated in um, their script with a similar total consideration value. I think it's been going up a little bit of recent oh. times, but yeah, not much. Yeah. Yeah. Silvercorp, who owns 16% of All Corp in their own right, they've had another 5% of All Corp shares outstanding, except their takeover offer getting them to 21% voting power presently, given you, you need 50.1% minimum acceptance in a takeover, and their offer will close this Friday night unless extended further. The deal on the table is looking pretty futile. So what? Okay, okay. So what's what's Perseus? They've made the play today. What's mm-hmm. the big changes, mate? They're they're um they appear to be capitalising with with what they dropped today. I'll, I'll run through those key key details. Firstly, they received Tanzanian Fair Competition Commission approval for their offer. Um, you know, Silver Corp, they similarly received this for their offer last week. And the fact that Perseus didn't have this approval was one of the things that the board, you know, drew upon to, to, to not, um, not recommend the Perseus offer or, or, or continue to recommend the Silver Corp one. Now that, now that Perseus have this approval, it comes with a catch, right? The approval is conditional upon the government of Tanzania getting a bigger slice of the project from a 16% free carried interest up to 20% now. And the way to think about this is Perseus, should they acquire Orcorp, they'll have to solve on CapEx of Nine Saga. The government will get a 20% equity interest in the project. And so you know, the, the dividends from that project co um, will, will pay out and be distributed 20% to the government and 80% to Perseus. So then that's – this will probably lead into your next point, but this is the first we've heard of this specific detail with the government, have we? And considering Silvercorp apparently already – have had it, but there was no mention that they had to do that. Yeah, I think there's been some, like you know, re- reporting that there's 
no, the, the contributions are, are subject to be like adjusted and finalized. There's there were the framework that was set by the Tanzanian government kind of had some fluidity, but this looks to basically lock in certainty, which is, you know, 20% free carried interest can't go further, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you're right. It's the first time we've seen a number 20%. And it's also like Perseus, they drop a bit of a revelation to your point, And that's, that's they reckon Perseus are basically, they suggest that silver Corp has had the exact same discussions with the government. They just haven't disclosed it to the market yet. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it already, um, like, yeah, I mean, you, you, I'll flash it up on screen now, but it's pretty interesting. They go, it has been made clear to Perseus that the Tanzanian government's intention to increase its interest in the Nine Zaga project um, uh, has had specific discussions relating it, it's regarding this with all prospective buyers seeking government approvals for a change of control of Orkor. Perseus believes that any silver corp agreement with the government of Tanzania, however described, is likely to be regarded by the government of Tanzania as an enforceable commitment. So they, um, <laughs> they're quick to, quick to highlight that one there. If it wasn't already enough pressure being applied by Perseus, they don't stop there. They point to some contingent liabilities and provisions disclosed in Orcorp's half-year accounts released Thursday last week. And they say there's some numbers there that weren't in your target statement. Specifically, there's an $18.8 million contingent liability pertaining to compensation being sought for resettlement and an $18 million provision for potential unpaid taxes to the Tanzanian Revenue Authority. Now, Perseus rightly point out that if Perseus acquire Orcorp, then you know those liabilities are simply assumed by Perseus, but Orcorp shareholders just get cash, so it doesn't affect them. Um, but if Silvercorp acquire Orcorp, then Silvercorp assume those liabilities, which um, Silvercorp shareholders... Uh, will basically feel the feel the brunt of, yeah, and which you know basically uh, will be all corp gets script, so so it kind of transfers over like that. Um, and there's more more pressure. Perseus aren't finished picking at the details of all corp's financial statements. They noticed that within the going concern section of the financials, all corp revealed that they're going to need to raise additional funds as soon as June, which is less than three months away. So all corp are under some real funding pressure here as well, and there's a bit of a clock ticking for them because of that. And, you know, Perseus, they offered the solution, a debt funding package conditional on the board changing their recommendation to accept the Perseus offer. Ah. <laughs> so they're squeezing them, right? We'll, we'll solve your problem for you, but you've got to, you've got to recommend our deal instead of the, the, the silver court one. Yeah. Oh, fa fascinating. As you say, by all of this without increasing the bid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it, it does increase the attractiveness, right? If you yeah. have a, a funding solution, that's yeah, that's increasing the attractiveness. If you assume those promise to assume those liabilities and shareholders don't feel it, that's increasing the attractiveness of it. Um, but there's more <laughs> truth in takeovers rule, like you said, Maddie. Well, Perseus they now declare that even if Silvercorp reach a fifty point one percent minimum acceptance of their offer, Perseus with their you know twenty odd percent um, shares that they own will not accept the offer. So before you know, they actually explicitly made this statement. Perseus were ultimately retaining the optionality to either accept it or, um, or if, pu if push came to shove, if it looked like they weren't going to, you know, win the day, then then that that's what they were basically holding onto that optionality. But now in their words, Silver Corp will not be able to consolidate 100% of All Corp and All Corp would need to fund and pay the Tanzanian change of control tax and continue funding development activities independently. So this is a full court press from Perseus. And honestly, I think they've got Orcorp cornered here. I'm not sure how Orcorp's board can, in good faith, continue to defend the Silver Corp offer as superior as a result of this anymore, unless Silver Corp come out here with a sweetener themselves. I'd be pretty disappointed in the Orcorp board if they continue to say that Silver Corp's offer is superior. And I, I think of this announcement as checkmate in, in the gamesmanship we've seen so far. The only other move that I think, you know, um, Perseus could have played if they really wanted to dial the pressure all the way to max heat <laughs> is to come out and declare their offer as best in final at that yep. 55 cents. So, Trav, you said that they've got 21% voting power currently, like 21% of people have accept. So They own 16, five, uh, five uh, of, yeah. Okay, so if you, if you remove the, like say they start recommending the, um, they go to recommend the Perseus offer, the yep. All Court board. Yeah. So technically, if the best that Perseus can get to is eighty four percent holding. N no, the 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 um the f oh the eighty four. Well, I mean, Silver Corp can always accept the Perseus offer themselves, yeah. so they can always 
get the cash from Perseus. Yeah, yeah. So, but it, there is potential that it could be a, a bloody stalemate. Bit of a stalemate situation. Keep in mind, Perseus is it's a takeover offer. So Perseus's minimum acceptance threshold here is fifty point one percent. You know, like at, at some point, like Silver Corp will. You know, I imagine if 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 it looks unlike like if 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 they're cornered, Silver Corp. If I was Silver Corp, you just accept the Perseus offer. Yeah, yeah. So, but they they need to they need Silver Corp to do it to get compulsory acquisition eventually. Otherwise, it's just going to be a, a dicey any sort of setup. To get compulsory acquisition, yes. Yeah. 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 Right. So yeah. that's that's your prediction. <laughs> uh, look, I, 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 I mean, to the point on on playing the the card on um, best and final or not. Like, if if they had have played the best and final card at that point, or corpse board, they they'd get the message that they literally cannot edge out a higher price from Perseus anymore. I probably would have played that card if I was them, but. I'm not across the game theory like you would be on the inside. There's probably other considerations there. But, yeah, but I think, look, ultimately, what what can Orcorp's board actually do here? I mean, they're like, you're going to come out and say, or oh, we continue to we continue to suggest the Silver Corp deal is superior given all of this. I mean, you look like a bit of a fuckwit if you do that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think you have to change your recommendation or – you know, have have a discussion with Silvercorp where Silvercorp end up adding a bit more bit more of a sweetener on top of what they already have, which um, definitely makes the value differential kind of look look more stark and then will Perseus come to party or not? Who knows? What, is there any rationale behind or if they do not from here some for whatever reason recommend the Perseus deal? Like is it <sighs> I well the only reason you would not do that is knowing that they haven't played the best and final card and you're just trying to edge out an uplift from them. Yeah. And it's just gamesmanship. That's why I would have played that card if I was them. But um but yeah, yeah, that's that, that's the only thing I could think of to be honest. Right. So do you think this is uh, you've talked about it before? Is this g- a good deal for Perseus? Is this a good use of their cash, especially now there's providing a debt facility as well potentially? Oh, I keep I just keep coming back to the same point and that's like wh- wh- why aren't they just buying back their own stock instead right i mean look at their trading multiple over the last five years this is their ev to ebitda looking forward the next 12 months and it's a trailing multiple like it's sorry it's a rolling multiple chart like chart so it's but it's like your ev to ebitda next 12 months as per broker consensus looking forward um and you see that Perseus trades at less than three times forward-looking EBITDA. That's a gold miner with three operations producing 500,000 ounces of gold a year at, at you know, cost of, of 1000 bucks an ounce trading at three times forward EBITDA. If, if you're as surprised as I am by that, like, look at that chart again, right? That multiple is also near a five-year low for this company. <laughs> the multiple they're trading at right now is such a head-scratcher to me when they've got all three mines sort of in steady state. And I, I continue to believe that Percy should send a strong message to all people like me that they think that they're undervalued too and announce a buyback right now instead of doing M&A. Like I'll, I'll run that same five-year rolling chart again, but this time it's a, a price to nav ratio for both Perseus and Orcorp. And you can see the de-risked Perseus trades at a lower multiple of nav compared to the undeveloped Orcorp. But, you know, who am I to advise uh, Perseus to change their winning formula so far? <laughs> well, potentially one of the reasons the <clears throat> the multiple, the EBITDA multiple is, you know, touching on a bit low recently is that investors think they're going to put money into bad M&A. Yeah, I, I think that, that multiple was, I mean, it's been trending lower it, for a while. Yeah, it's, it's been of course, three times since. Of course, but the cash pile has been building and building and maybe investors aren't certain of the capital allocation framework that they've got maybe the investors probably back the team as well given they've they're proven um, yeah deliverers but yeah i i, I just think you, yeah if you have more like tr- tricks than just m a for growth or like m a for for for, uh, for for return to shareholders like it gives you a, a bit more of a, a rounded appeal as well um I, I completely agree and we spoke about this for the first time probably three odd months ago um Woff similarly is trading on a on a very cheap multiple. They've, you know, not in the position to buy back either, but there's just that real risk off sentiment on all these companies. And with what you said at the beginning there of the free carried interest jumping from sixteen percent in Tanzania to twenty percent, it makes the you know, the Nangzaga project less appealing. Mm. And from 
Tanzanian perspective, it's like they're trying to scare off investment into the country. It's not not a good omen. Is is the uh, is one only one possible way to re-rate as an African gold miner to become more geographically diverse in Africa, which could be a bit of a play here to get more country – like they're going to obviously lift their ounce profile, but it's more country diversification. To an extent, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it helps. WAF is obviously Burkina focus. Perseus already has a bit of that. But, that, yeah, I think to an extent that does help. Oh, wait and see. Oh, I love it. You love this. This is like – did this make your day, Trav? Mate, this is, we're, this is like end game a little bit. I think, um, yeah, the – there's not too much more left in this story. Oh, bloody love it. Right. Keeping over. Good overseas feel for the back end of the show. Nickel Industries. Something we don't um, yeah, we don't talk about too much, but Jesus Christ, she's a big humdinger of a show, that Nickel Industries, boys. Yeah, the the one or one of few ASX listed nickel miners to, you know, not be in, in dire straits at the moment. So a bit of an update on mining, sales and government approvals in Indonesia, so all up not really great announcement. They couldn't sell ore through Jan and most of Feb. There were these permitting delays across the whole of Indonesia. So nickel miners in the country there need to get these things called an RCAB license, which essentially approves the amount of nickel ore volume that you can sell over a certain period. So there had been in you know a heightened uh, scrutiny about how these licenses were handled handed out in the midst of the presidential election, which happened on, I think, Feb 14th in, in Indonesia. So in the end, their Hen, Henjaya mine got a three-year approval, which is a bit longer than normal. So that's quite good for the company. And they said they're going to get more haul trucks out to the mine site to try and make up in the coming months what they lost over the earlier months of this year. The nickel industry's main asset, though, is the um, the RKF production lines that they have. So they also suffered on the back of this, what I just mentioned in Jan and Feb, because they had lower levels of ore coming in. They treated lower grade ore. They, I mean, they were producing nickel pig iron of 11.7% for the first couple months, and that's already jumped up to 13.9% on the back of getting higher grade ore in. So they had a, a lot of sort of positive gloss throughout the announcement, but all in it, it wasn't that great. EBITDA is expected to be US 40 million bucks lower than the March quarter last year. So down from roughly $113 million to $70 million. Now, of course, nickel pig iron prices have come down substantially from that point in time as well. But I thought it would just be an interesting starter to for us to talk about nickel industries because they're this sort of big behemoth that we haven't really got into because they're big, they're complex. They've got, you know, I think the top 20 own 85% of the company. They've got a lot of foreign interest in the company. But yeah, I mean, the, the one nickel company that isn't under a crazy amount of, well, stress to the same extent that BHB, Wailu and all these other guys are. Because it's in Indonesia. Exactly. Exactly <laughs> right. Right. Speaking of, speaking of these metal prices, JD, there's a bit bloody going on uh, in the last week or so. We've seen iron ore down 14% last week. Last week, 30% since January. So that's a, a big drop off, trading at about 100 bucks for the, the 62% product. And, you know, on the flip side, copper jumped up 5% last week alone, over 9,000 US dollars a ton again, over you know, four bucks and seven cents roughly a pound. So obviously we touched on what was going on in copper last week. They had additional smelters coming online, concentrate supply cuts from around the world, Cobra Panama and all these other operations. So that sort of led to smelters deciding to cut production. We spoke about a big, you know, meeting of 15 odd smelters coming together last week in China. And ultimately, it looks like that's going to lead to maintenance schedules being shifted around, some of the startup smelters being delayed before they come online, as well as cuts from unprofitable smelters. So much more of a supply side impact in terms of copper there. And you can see it in Sandfire. I'm not sure if you guys have checked them out, but they're trading near all-time highs again. I think 8 bucks 60 last time I looked. So they're getting right up there. They've got a lot of talk to that. I was about to say the T word. There talk, we go. I like it. So on the flip side, you got iron ore. So there's a lot of fears around the Chinese property sector, and that's really driving this more of a demand side fear for this commodity. So you've got stockpiles being at record highs at um, steel smelters in China, and hence people are expecting demand to fall. You've also had for a long time people just thinking the Chinese government is going to come in with big infrastructure stimulus spending that is going to you know, prop up the 
the property sector there and whatnot, but this hasn't really materialized. So if you have a look at FMG, the, the biggest pure play iron ore miner, as well as other iron ore miners, you can see they're down 20 plus percent since early Feb. So Jeez. only a month and a bit. Now, That's fucking 800 million bucks of Twiggy's dividends, that is. Wow. I mean, granted, they'd been coming from an astoundingly high level. They'd been coming down from all-time highs of almost 30 bucks. So, yeah, I mean, sort of going in, in reverse to what Sandfire has been doing. Now, Iron Ore Bulls will point out that people make a lot of this Chinese property sector, but that's actually been making up a, a diminishing portion of what the overall global steel demand has been is, you know, nowadays. But, I mean, I, I know we talk about Minres all the time, but that, that's another company that has come straight to my mind with Onslow coming online. You know, they are going to want to see that that iron ore price mm. stay up and about so they can really chip away at that debt profile that they've got quite quickly. Yeah, and hearing a lot about Simand do a lot in the media now is the uh, touted as the potential Pilbara killer because there, that's like, I think it's like 65 66%. So it's like really some of the... Very, very yeah, high grade ore and a shitload of it. And first ore coming in in 2025, I believe. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be obviously a big, long ramp up because it's so it's so friggin' huge. Yeah, I think 30, month, 30 months till it gets to full. Just when it's fucking humming, you know. Getting there, Yeah, mate. so that's that's yeah. very interesting landscape. Mm. Yeah. So what well, the effect that that's going to have. And Brazil totally. as well, also getting back to the levels. Obviously, they've had um, a couple shocking um, incidents in... 2015, 2019. So they've been getting up to those those heightened levels of output as well. A few other bits coming online. Yeah. Oh, maybe bloody Lake Johnson's going to save Minres <laughs> if the iron ore price goes down. <laughs> Uh, right, Javois. Jeez, I remember every time I talk of Javois, I just remember Sorry. Trav's house. <laughs> Sorry, mate. I was just thinking of like, oh, what has Minres's business become if lithium and iron ore go to shit? Maybe the toll road, you just charge tourists driving on it <laughs> instead of people like going iron ore. Anyway, uh, yeah, go on. <laughs> Javois. Javois. <laughs> Annual report came out today. And That's amongst staying in there. The Winnebago is just paying a fucking <laughs> the, the bloody. Um, the grey nomads would love it. <laughs> Holiday park. Oh, right. Javois. Javois reminds me of Trav's house. Yep. Back in the day where we used to film there, there was just there was a lot of Javois talk mm, last year. And it's, it's quite nostalgic, boys. Mm. Yeah. Right, sure is. Take me away. <laughs> no worries, Matty. <laughs> uh, what a company, mate. Oh, geez. Uh, they released their annual report today amongst four other announcements to ASX. And, I, and I've got to have a bit of a rant about a friend of the show, Mr. Bryce Crocker, because I opened the annual report and I read a Crocker shit in the remuneration section that infuriates me. <laughs> a Crocker shit. <laughs> <laughs> For context, the share price of this company is li literally down 97% in less than two years. So you don't have to be a genius to know that that is abysmal underperformance. He won an award as well at our, uh, at our awards night in November that we did. <laughs> the annual report uh, pertains to calendar year 2023. So if you just look at that period, share price fell about 84%. In fact, this company once had a market cap of one and a half billion and now it's a mere $65 million crap co. So look, if the company's share price and valuation is so beaten up, what, what kind of re remuneration is appropriate for the CEO who has steered the company through this period? Does eight hundred and forty-two thousand dollars in cash super and fringe benefits sound appropriate to you guys? <laughs> oh, geez, that's not bad. Take it while you can get it. <laughs> how about how about equity alignment with you know shareholders? Because um, in twenty twenty-three, Bryce's value of equities proportion of total re remuneration was a mere eleven percent, which is substantially lower than five of the six other key management personnel, which I've circled there. So let me spell this out as simply as possible. If you led the company through a period where you know, the company's share price lost 97% in less than two years. Your risk-free remuneration should not be 1.3% of the company's market cap. This comment on hot copper captures my frustration. Uh, director KMP re remuneration in total was uh, down 2.8% from, uh, from the 2022 calendar year to the 2023 one, but the share price was down 84%. <laughs> and look, right, the share price today has fallen 14%. Uh, on, on the day, despite none of those announcements being, you know, marked as market sensitive. The company having suspended construction at its mine ICO revealed in its annual report, a uh, US $174 million write down in 2023 relating to that project. And look, the, the company's cash balance, um, yeah, continues to dwindle despite adjusted EBITDA being not so grim, but ugh, this is um, a pretty, yeah, pretty, pretty frustrating company. If you look at their, their net debt, it's still quite substantial. It's, 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 um, yeah, 
frustrating larger than the market cap is that is that is the debt of this of this company so you know i think there's there's frustration in the cobalt market i'd be frustrated with remuneration of of, of exec there and you just want you want sensibleness not 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 not, not this shit yeah, and the uh, the notion of a, a standalone co-op play in the in the face of it being a byproduct from copper and nickel seems to be um, you know proving not the way to go about things. Yeah, and then mm. chucking a bunch of debt into the cap structure, recipe for success. Mm. Right, it's regis. God, the bloody dude. We didn't get the rain in Perth, but it appears frigging out bloody bush. There must have been this piss and rain everywhere. We talked about Capricorn, Gold Road and West Gold, but uh, Regis already pro- uh, announcing some uh, impacts to production as well. Mate, every corner of WA has been getting poured on. We spoke about Capricorn, Gold Road, West Gold and, and more. So Dukedon, that had limited losses, although they did, they did cop a lot of rain there. Tropicana has had a suspension in mining now, now treating – Stockpiles, just like all those um, other companies we spoke about. So the supply road between cow and, and trops is closed. And if that does continue and consumables, you know, get exhausted and can't reach the mine site, there could be, you know, worse things to come. But in the meantime, they've uh, reiterated guidance, although like all the other operators, they'll be at the higher end of costs, lower end of uh, ounces. So, yeah, we'll keep a close eye and see if any more rain hits those guys. Oh, mate, you want to... You wanna- a recipe for a fucking unhappy mine side is when supplies get chopped off. Because when you like mandatory gloves, glasses, bloody tools to do the job if they're just not there, and it's like rules enforced to have them. Oh mate, it is. You have to start reusing shit, and you know miners are pretty precious. Right? <laughs> and so once you got to really, you know, work a bit hard, the and act like a bit of a owner, owner of the business. Oh mate, it's just carnage. <laughs> so are uh, the good old days. No, no issues to the supply chain to Hay Street boys. So oh, I'm loving this version of life. <laughs> Learning from you every day, Matty. Oh, Good stuff, happy, fellas. Happy to help, boys. Right, oh, thanks to all the bloody partners. Oh, who do we have at the top show? Get wet. And do yourself a favour and get wet. K drill as well. K drill, mate. Get Jesus. in touch. Men res don't go down the drill and route while K drill are around, mate. We've also got Verify, DSI Underground, Smack Power and Technology. Bloody, there better be some freaking VSDs going to mine sites or I'm going to lose my shit. Anytime exploration services, KCA site services, Brooks Airways, and that'll be bloody it, ladies and gents. Hooteroo. Hooteroo, fellas. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation, and needs.